between Europe and the Middle East, there was always a special relationship. They shared the common geography and humanity of the Mediterranean, and through history, their influence on each other was constant and lasting. In medieval times, Islam was Europe's only powerful cultural and human challenge. Where Europe was not surrounded by water, it was surrounded by Islam. Europe conquered the oceans, the Americas, India, long before it was able to subdue the Muslims. By the 19th century, the kind of power which the Industrial Revolution created allowed the Europeans to influence the whole Earth, and rapidly. More than at any other time in history, no society had the protection of distance or time to adjust. And for good and ill, all peoples, economies, and governments became subject to the same complex set of forces. Beginning with Algeria in 1830, most Arab countries fell under the direct control of France and England. And by the end of the First World War, only the Arabian Peninsula itself remained free. But the age of European empire ended after the Second World War. Sooner or later, all Arab countries gained independence, all except Palestine. British rule and American support had encouraged the creation of a Jewish national home. Today, for the Jews who settled in Palestine and founded the State of Israel, the land is theirs. For the Palestinian Arabs dispossessed or else living under Israeli rule, it is theirs also. It is this conflict which keeps alive for Arabs the sense of living under the shadow of the West. Edward Said understands that well. He was born in Jerusalem, and for 30 years he has lived in America. mysterious East, a place of fantasy, imagination, desire. This Orient has been created by the West, by artists, thinkers, dreamers, and adventurers. It gives fantastic expression to some reality that Europeans either wanted to possess or feared. Fabulous names, Harun al-Rashid, Amar Khayyam, Shahrazad. Fabulous places, Samarkand, Arabia Felix, Jerusalem the Golden. The lure of Jerusalem is uniquely powerful. It evokes the idea of the fabulous Orient, but it is also of a deeper significance to Muslims, Jews, and Christians. So strangers are drawn to Jerusalem the Golden, the Jerusalem of the Holy Land, to sing their songs of it, see its sights, sample its wares, savor its mystery. One, take pictures. Yeah, yeah. Come on, Kojak. One, two, three. Kojak, come on. Harry, one. That's the English Kojak. Want to go school? Kojak, oh, I'm afraid. I'm holding your hand. It is OK. Bring me a parachute. Woo! Okay. Woo! Woo! Okay. I love you. <laughs> Hey, 
The tourists come with their own thoughts of this place, their own concerns. They see, but they do not comprehend. Insulated from the hard political facts, the conflicts of interest, visitors cannot see how involved they are in what appears to be foreign and distant. Israel captured Jerusalem in 1967 and claimed to have unified it forever. In fact, Jerusalem is a deeply divided city. The Palestinian Arabs are subject to Israeli military rule. More than a million Palestinians live under Israeli occupation in East Jerusalem, the West Bank, and Gaza. About 650,000 more are citizens of the Jewish state. The lives of all of them are directly affected by the affliction of being a subject people, strangers in their own land. In East Jerusalem, they are helpless dwellers in what has been made an Arab ghetto at the heart of the Jewish state. This war between peoples, a war which has been fought for generations and which concerns the whole world, is, I believe, inextricably entangled with the fantasies, dreams, and ambitions of the West to rule and possess the East. To some extent, the state of Israel itself has been created and sustained by those fantasies, dreams, and ambitions. I was born in Jerusalem when it was part of a country called Palestine. By 1948, when Palestine became Israel, all my family had left. My birthplace is now inaccessible to me. For many hundreds of thousands of my fellow Palestinians, their native towns, villages, farms are inaccessible to them. Channel 62, Detroit. Some of us found ourselves in America, adding to the chorus of ethnic voices absorbed into American life. Good evening and welcome to the Arab Voice TV program. Before we start, I would like to wish all of you a happy Valentine's Day. And now here is the outline of our program in Arabic. <laughs> All the Arabs who come to America come in different ways, of course, under different pressures. All of us, however, attempt to rediscover and reestablish our identities. In Detroit, for example, the native places live on in social clubs and community events. <laughs> People who came to America from Beit Hanina, a suburb of Jerusalem, sustain their community, keep it alive, both culturally and politically.
Some people in exile move closer to what they perceive as American ways. Yet the ironies of exile represent themselves. Affluent Palestinians in Detroit celebrate in style by enjoying images of the Orient. But not the Orient of their memory or of their reality, rather the exotic images of Western imagination. The fabled harem dance is performed by a Mexican girl born in Detroit. dancer presides over a gallery of characters who embody the Orient. Mysterious, seductive, sensual, and cruel. Usually, the Arab is represented as the other, deviant or excessive, less trustworthy, less human. One important function of these images is, I believe, that they justify the use of Western power to seek control over the East and to possess its riches. Frankly, I spend a great deal of my time being angry. I mean, wherever you turn, you read a bit of the newspaper or you see on television, you know, the fact that we're, we're never described in, or rarely described in ways that, 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 that you can, not, it's not a question of identifying with it, in ways that, that don't offend you. The, and for us as Palestinians, yeah. obviously we have a greater challenge yeah. in this society, which is hostile to our, yeah, because our a, history, yeah. as well as our, to, uh, to, to our reality yes. and to our aspirations. Yeah. So that there's the general problem of right. being an Arab, an but Arab. there's a particular and problem of being a Palestinian. Being Palestinian. Yeah. And this has created, of course, uh, uh, severe contradictions for all of us. I came in 1950. And I lived in the Midwest at that time. Uh, and when people asked me where I come from, I said, I come from Palestine. And for them, they, they had two connections with Palestine. Uh, one connection is that it is the Holy Land, mm. and therefore images of old prophets and Christianity and so forth. Yeah. Or that I come from a place which is now known as Israel. Yeah. My identity, in that sense, was a, a neither understood nor accepted as someone who is not biblical and someone who is not Israeli. And yeah, it's strange how insistent that is because, I mean, historically that's really been the case starting with the Crusades. I mean, if you think about it, that the Crusades had absolutely nothing to do, in a sense, with the people who were there, except, as you said, that they were non-Christian. Right. And they were the people who were in possession of Christian places that were thought of as European in some strange way. And that began this extraordinary, to me, somewhat irrational uh, movement where people said, well, that's our land, it's the holy land, it belongs to Europe and Christianity, let's go and get it. <laughs> Each year, during Holy Week, the power of the idea of the Holy Land is made apparent. Pilgrims from all over the world join the native Christians of Jerusalem and engulf the old city in their journey to the Holy Sepulchre.
but in other times, the power of this idea moved armies and whole nations. Nine hundred years ago, Christian Europe decided to reclaim the Holy Land, Western Christianity's Holy Land, from the Saracen Muslims. The Crusaders set up fiefdoms and kingdoms all over the Eastern Mediterranean. Most of these European Crusaders left after a time, but impressive evidence of their invasions remains. The landscape is still dominated by Crusader redoubts, and they are fought over once again in what seems to be an endless sequence of violence and counter-violence. In 1190, the Frankish castle of Beaufort fell to Saladin. Between 1978 and 1982, it was a frontline position for Palestinian guerrillas in Lebanon. From the heights of Beaufort, they could look toward their Palestine. ففي قلعة الشقيف انطلقت جحافل الفتح العربي الإسلامي لتحرير الأراضي الفلسطينية من الصليبيين إضافة إلى أنها لأن موقع القلعة يعتبر موقع استراتيجي وحيوي من الناحية السياسية والمعنوية بالنسبة للثورة الفلسطينية ويعتبر موقع عسكري مهم أيضا بالنسبة للعدو الصهيوني فلسطين ما حد مش نطري مش نطر حدا لا حد نطر فلسطيني يعني إحنا مقتلنا ما حداش بيقاتل ورانا كل أمن إحنا فيها فلسطين يعني إنه قاعدين فيها عاملين دولة عربية ونعمر يعني يكون بالبيت الهربان الخربان الدنيا بنعمرها فيلاد الدنيا والأرض من فلاحة بنزرع إيش والتف إيش ما فينا عن نزرع يعني خيار بصل كوسة ال الموجود نزرع صحيح تمن عيش عيشة رادي It is good land in this region, but no farmer today can harvest this land in peace. Farmers in the shadow of Beaufort have lived with a fire of aircraft, tanks, and artillery for more than a decade. In 1982, the Israelis moved into Lebanon and took Beaufort for themselves. <laughs> 